you saw the local varan, a statistic for each location. Only the significant ones are being mapped. And then um, the cluster map adds to that and really combines two things, the local varan with the scatter plot and the four categories of uh, association. The, another <coughs> feature is related to the fact that the local statistics uh, add up to the global. In fact, the global is the average of the local. So one uh, device to assess how some points may have excessive influence on the global statistic is to put the individual local Moran statistics in a box plot. And so the box plot is simply a cumulative distribution, if you wish, that shows how far apart these values are. The median is in the middle. What you're interested in here is any kind of asymmetry or any kind of outliers. Outliers in the sense of specific to the local statistics. So these are local statistics that are either much larger than the others or much smaller than the others. This doesn't necessarily mean that they're significant. Because they're not the same thing. It's the magnitude. Now, if these large ones happen to be surrounded by others that are small and large mixed together, then that's nothing significant. Okay. So the significance itself needs to be uh, assessed separately. But basically, we're interested, this is more of a diagnostic, in situations where one or two locations may have an, a lot of influence on our global measure. So this looks like uh, any other scatter plot. This is the North Carolina case. So we have two lower outliers here and a few higher outliers. And then you can see by linking and brushing whether these are in fact significant on the significance map and, and so on. The, um, this gets me back to what I was starting to discuss, the actual notion of clusters and outliers. That um, the map shows, as I mentioned, those locations that have a significant local Moran statistic. So we compute the local Moran for each location. If it's significant, we map it. If it's an outlier, that's a location that is different from its neighbors. So an outlier is a single location by definition because it's different from its neighbors. So the map for the outliers shows the outliers. For the clusters, it's not quite the same, because a cluster is a location that is similar to its neighbors. So most of us, when we think of the cluster, think of the whole thing, not just the core of the cluster. And the maps, as they are now, only show the core of the cluster. So if you think of it, and you have a situation like here, where you have these high red, high high cluster, and here low low cluster, the actual cluster is more like the shaded shape. And on an intuitive level, um, what you see here are, is similar to what happens when you tighten the p-value. So say you run this with a p, 0.05, and then you say, I want to set the significance level at, at 0.01, these clusters shrink. And say only this one in the middle here would be left. But then its neighbors would be the surrounding ones that were significant at 0.05. So it's always a good idea to uh, assess the sensitivity of the clusters that you locate to the p-value that you use, and to see how much change there is or how little change there is. I mean, if there's not a lot of change, then you could be fairly confident that these are real clusters. If there's a lot of change, then it may have more to do with the p-value that you use. It may be spurious, so it may not be real clusters. And this is where we're getting in the gray zone between pure exploratory analysis and actual significance testing, if you remember in the very beginning, I mentioned that 
purists of EDA, of exploratory data analysis, do not include hypothesis tests. There's no testing. In fact, the whole point of EDA is to generate hypotheses, and that's it. Here, we're actually carrying out tests. These are tests for local spatial autocorrelation. So, in some sense, it's already beyond EDA. But it is not modeling, and, and you have to keep in mind um, don't necessarily make too much of this. Okay? This is just pattern recognition. This finds patterns in the data. And then the next step is to figure out why these pattern, patterns occur. Why are they where you find them? Is it because of some multivariate association? So they're really correlated with something else. And so that your univariate analysis misses that correlation. And that's really what what we want to find. Is it because of a scale mismatch? Um, spatial autocorrelation measures similarity with the neighbors. If you measure phenomena at too small a scale, all the neighbors will be the same. Um, I have seen an example of this just recently. Um, somebody had looked at um, NDVI. This is a, a, a vegetation index from remotely sensed images, and had um, basically created a lot of small polygons in an, an area that was basically all the same. So you have, say, a forest or some area where you cultivate some crop. Then the images for those fields, let's say you have tiny little fields, and they all cultivate the same crop the NDVI for all these fields will be pretty much the same thing because they are the same thing. So if you do a spatial correlation analysis of that at that scale, you'll get huge clusters of highs and of lows that are basically telling you everything is the same here. And in fact, this is not that interesting in terms of spatial correlation, but it's interesting because it points to a scale mismatch. The phenomenon that you're studying, the crops, is not measured at the proper scale. It should be measured at a more regional scale, not at this micro scale. It's the same, you know, in time series. If you take things and they don't change, you know, if you measure something every minute and it's not changing, it's going to be highly correlated. But that's not meaningful. It's just telling you it's not changing. A lot in a Oftentimes, when you find very large blobs of clusters with these local analyses, it's more uh, an indication of a mismatch of the scale of your measurement with the scale of the phenomenon that you study. So if you study regional labor markets and you measure them at the census tract level, it doesn't make a lot of sense. because the, the vari There's no variation. So you have to measure something at a scale where there is variability. In some sense, high positive spatial autocorrelation tells you there is no variability. In fact, you can use this to compress data. You know, if the data are all the, cell, the same in space, then you can represent them by many fewer numbers than you actually observe. And this is something that can be exploited in image processing or Know, compression of, of you know, JPEGs and things like that. You have various algorithms that exploit the similarity of nearby pixels, which is just another word for local spatial autocorrelation. And so when you interpret this, be very careful, don't overwrite, don't overdo it. It's an exploratory technique. It tells you a lot about patterns in the data, but not everything. In fact, a lot of things it doesn't tell you in that it is primarily a univariate technique. Now, you can extend it, we won't do this um, in this class, you can extend it to a bivariate situation, but the interpretation, and that's why we don't do it in this class, the interpretation is very difficult because this is similarity of one variable at a location with another variable at neighboring locations. 
but that's not necessarily what you think it is, so we won't get into that. But the bottom line is this is a very um, efficient technique to very quickly see if there's um, specific patterning in the data. You're looking for clusters. If you find clusters, you want to see if clusters for different variables occur in the same location. That gives you a sense for their possible correlation in the multivariate sense. Outliers are very interesting. If you do um, quality assurance, you can make, you, you should check whether these outliers are real outliers or coding mistakes. Uh, in, from a substantive point of view, the outliers could be interesting for an, an additional analysis. Say if you do an aggregate analysis, you're looking at neighborhoods, and you find neighborhoods that are very different from the ones that surround them, then it might be worth your while to actually go on the ground and look around and see what it is in that place that it makes it so different from its neighbors. And, and that's another way in which you can use it. Let me just close with a quick overview of the G-statistics, which are an alternative to the local Moran. And the, um, the history of the G-statistics is um, interesting. The local Moran, as I mentioned to you, the way I got to it was through the Moran scatter plot and starting to focus on what these individual points were and then realizing that there was a direct connection between the global and the local, simply additive. The GI statistics come out of the work by primarily Arquetis on point pattern analysis. And if you remember point pattern analysis, what we looked at we had these two functions. One was the empty space function, which basically looked at the distance to the nearest point from a ref any reference point. And then the other one was the nearest distance type function, where you, you took a, looked at the actual observations and saw how far you had to go to get another point. Or in the K function, counted how many points were in a particular distance from a given reference point. Now, take this and then give, make them a marked point pattern. Make, give values to the points. And then you're basically at the concept of the GI statistic, which is essentially an averaging of the values observed within a given radius from a, a point, and then building inference for that. So it's very similar in spirit to this notion of a k-function, which is also looking at how many points do I get within a given ratio. What's different is that different is that it is location specific. So, uh, in the original applications of the G statistics, they weren't actually computed, even though you can't compute them for all uh, locations, but they were computed for a given location. And then the interest was to see, you know, how. Uh, is there any kind of systematic patterning around that location? For example, incidence of disease around a given place where the disease was first observed. That's one of the first applications of the G statistics. It is in spirit a local, a LISA, but in a strict sense it's not because the, the adding up is nothing. So there is no global statistic that uh, is proportional to the sum of the local. More formally, the two, there's two G statistics, GI and GI star. They're both the same idea. Namely, you take for each location I a simple sum of the values observed within a distance radius. This is where it came from. Now, this can be easily generalized in that the WI weight, uh, WIJ could be any weight, not just a distance weight. It could be a contiguity weight. But the original idea was, let's take a point, let's take a distance, and count how many, what values we have, the y, j, in that radius, and take that as a proportion to the sum of all the values in the system. So essentially, it is the proportion of the y's within the distance band centered on a given location relative to all the y's in the whole system. Uh, the sum over j of yj doesn't change. 
that's just a simple rescaling. So in essence, what the statistic consists of is these bands around each location that sum the values observed in the radius. The difference between the two statistics is whether or not the location itself is included. It's not in the GI, it is in the GI star. And this has some um, repercussions on significance testing and things like that, um, which we won't get into. Um, inference, um, same as before, analytical, you use a randomization assumption. You can uh, derive what the mean would be under the null and what the variance would be. Uh, preferred approach is computational, where, again, we do permutation. Now, very important, the interpretation of the G statistics is different from the interpretation of the local moran. In the local moran, we have four categories. We have two clustering, high, high, and low, low, and two spatial outliers, high, low, and low, high. In the G statistic, we only have clusters. They're either clusters of high values or clusters of low values. There are no outliers. It's a subtle difference, but it's sometimes a cause of confusion. If you have a negative G statistic that is a clustering of low values, it is not a spatial outlier. So the G statistic is um, geared to detecting clusters and clusters only. The local Moran detects clusters and spatial outliers. Now, which one should you use? It, it really depends. I mean, if there are spatial outliers present, that will affect the power of the G statistic. But if there aren't any, that will affect the power of the local Moran, which looks for too many different kinds of things if you only have to look for clusters. That's one way to think about it. And then the visualization is the same. We have a map of significant locations with different p-values. We can have the positive one, the negative one. That's all, uh, basically, uh, that's all there is to it. So the, um, this concludes the, the three major approaches to spatial autocorrelation. The first one being point patterns, the second one dealing with surfaces, and the semi-variogram as the main technique. And then the third one deals with discrete spatial locations and uses the notions of global and local spatial autocorrelation.